guys, um, thank you for coming in such a rainy day. We have a visitor. His name is Mark uh, Loren. And um, Dr. Loren is um, actually a specialist in acoustic doctor profilers and remote sensing. And he applied these methods to map uh, habitats. And so his talk actually today is related to this kind of technology. I think he can show some applications. Some applications of the. Sure, yeah. Greetings, everyone. Appreciate you coming, Dr. Sherman. Thanks for inviting me. It's a long plane ride from Montana, I can tell you that. Um, I've been working for quite a few years uh, at the University of Montana as a biological fish. I'm a physical scientist, a, a coastal oceanographer, a small hydrologist, it's kind of the thing I'm interested in. But I've spent two decades uh, working with liver ecologists where my total role is to put the physical template in place for them to look at uh, how the organisms play out their activity. And so I spent a lot of time learning about river ecology. Basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about flow modeling and then a little bit and a lot about river mapping, contrast the two, see how they're different. Uh, talk about aquatic habitat and how that uh, relates to what we can map in a river using hydroacoustic methods. Uh, I developed a software called River Analyzer that allows us to integrate um, all the data you get out of these uh, acoustic Doppler profilers. And then I'm going to give a, just a little example application about how we applied this to uh, looking at pilot stewards <coughs> in uh, below Fort Peck in Montana. <coughs> this is the uh, kind of research area on in, on the middle fork of the Flathead. In the foreground here is Glacier National Park, and the Great Rail Wilderness is on the other side. And it's a really nice <coughs> photograph of a lot of complexity in a river system. And we're looking at this particular river at a, a real low flow. And during floods, of course, it occupies the scour zone. You can see how it's been all over this floodplain. If you get back in here and went back about 400 years, it would look just like this now. So this constant shifting of, of habitats and that mosaic of habitats is what drives a healthy ecosystem for rivers. And this one isn't impacted with any kind of flow regulations. Uh, there's a railroad along the highway. But other than that, it's a, it's a, it's a free-flowing system. And the uh, question is, where are all the fish? What is the habitat? We know they're in the river. We don't really know where. We don't know all of the habitats they're going to use in various life cycles. This is typically the answer you're going to get from your local, me and my local fishing guides. I love fishing on this river. There's some really, really prime spots to go to. But the goal here is to look at, to try to determine the total abundance of habitat and then how that habitat is spatially distributed across that floodplain or that river system. And of course, how those variables change as discharge changes. So that's kind of the theme I want to take through this, this talk, how we approach that. And we'll start with uh, looking at three types of flow data. Or this is my version of, there's probably other ways of looking at it. But <clears throat> we first have a snapshot. You know, an aerial photograph or a satellite that shows the spatial flow structure. People use this in atmospheric science, we see it in oceanography, and, and we also see it used in rivers as well. The other is this Eulerian framework, which means you have a current meter, and the, and the water flows past you, and you're measuring that flow. Could be a weather station fixed in, fixed in space. The other type is this Lagrangian framework, and this is a go-with-the-flow type of measurement extensively used in atmospheric science, used in oceanography, but it's not used at all in rivers, very rarely. 
So we're just kind of getting out of this idea of fixed measurements in satellite imagery. And hence that's the missing link in the river work uh, that I do. And I'm trying to fill this hole if you want. Here's a typical gauging station. This is a river, I think it's the Rio Grande in, in uh, Texas. And uh, there's nobody coming over the hill, so we're safe. But all of our efforts now are going back and forth across here using acoustic Dopplers to measure the discharge, how much water is flowing past. And then the rest of the river, we basically try to model to say what it would be like in terms of how much habitat is out there. And we'll define the habitat. All we can really predict with the model is how deep and how fast it's going for all the square meters that are out there. But all the fish don't live at the gauging station. So this is just a little example I like to give to people. Um, assuming folks don't know much about flow modeling, there might be a lot of modelers in here. But HECRAS 1D is a one form of a 1D model. And you go to a cross section, you try to get its area, and you try to get its mean flow, and assume everything's flowing the same direction and about the same rate. There's a whole host of 2D models out there that will segregate things into um, various velocities. And then there's 3D modeling, which will give you the velocity across the river and then down to depth. And with River Analyzer, what we do is we go out and we kind of measure it. This is a, actually a, a slice from a river uh, using the hydroacoustic instruments. And you can see how really fine-tuned uh, the flow is. The trouble is, 3D flow modeling, you can do in about one to two kilometers, maybe five kilometers of river. 2D modeling, I've seen stuff up to 10 kilometers and more. 1D, of course, you can go for hundreds of kilometers. So in, in each of the model applications, you have to get some cross sections across the river. And if you're, uh, and that's just time consuming, depending upon how big the river, you might spend, you know, a half an hour for each cross section. You have slow velocity, you need to know um, it's the, the water surface slope across there, and you're going to use concept of conservation of momentum, mass, volume, whatever the, the equations they're using, to predict what's going on in between these cross sections. Okay, what we do is we go down the river and get a 3D view of the whole river. And this is actually a river that's tied, uh, the channel's tied to the LIDAR, and we can select slices anywhere. So this is just an example. And you notice up in the corner there, there is a, uh, there we go. But this is an eddy circulating back in here. Now, one and two D modeling would be very difficult to get that. Three D modeling, you could begin to approach that, but you have to have a lot of data in that area to get after it. So let's get back to aquatic habitat. And this is a uh, section of the uh, Snake River I've been working on. I know it's a good fishing hole because I caught a lot of fish here. You know, and growing up in Montana and fly fishing, I know exactly where to go to ask the flies, what flies to use, where little fish are, where big fish are. You just learn that through experience. Um, but you can't take fishermen and just look down the river and, and say how much habitat there is. I mean, you can, not a lot. But um, how do we actually get at some sort, of, some sort of a quantitative measurement of what's a good fishing hole? One way to start, and is using these traditional names of, of river types, we see rapids and riffles and eddies and tailouts and glides, and we know that different organisms prefer these different habitats. They may use, like glides are commonly used for spawning for salmon. But can we go to these habitats now and measure how deep they are and how fast they're flowing and say something quantitatively about how much of that habitat is out there. How much of this is a ripple? How much is it in an eddy? And then how many are there in that river system as you move down? So what we do is we use ADPs, and I'm going to explain that uh, there, uh, in detail a little bit what they are, but they're a way, a way to measure how deep the water is and how fast it's flowing. And then um, I developed this software that integrates that data. So the next slide we'll show you is a slice right down that black line of an ADP run. So you can see the depth intervals 
how deep it is, and then 10 centimeters is actually uh, a little deeper bend intervals, how fast the water's flowing. So we can look at the whole flow field, we get a nice velocity profile. You're in the sediment transport, you can start getting after, you know, shear stresses, and is it should it be mobile? You can see areas in the river where, you know, we're reaching right to the bed and actually probably doing some work there. These are boundary, bottom boundary layers that are important to all sorts of organisms with fish out. Typically, we'd go down the river with many runs. These are taken for just interested in this one fishing hole, this one uh, reach. We'd take one ADP. I mean, I start out with one, not a whole fleet, <laughs> and we'd do multiple flows all day long. You could do, you know, this river here in an hour and have a really good, you just pulverize that whole uh, section. And I spent a lot of time doing that because <laughs> it's easy. Well, the hard part is when you get all the data, and then what do you do with all that? And I spent a long time trying to figure that out. Now I'm back to measure. So let me explain just a little bit um, how this works in getting the keys. First of all, we go with the flow. This is one of my river team members. Any of you uh, guys see The Revenant, the movie Revenant? You know the scene where the guy goes over the waterfall and his little gear? Well, that was Kootenai Falls in Montana, and he broke his femur when he hit the bottom. The stunt, and this guy was the uh, led the, the safety crew, and he hauled him out with his kayak. He like, was all over the little kayak and, and saved his life, basically. <laughs> so we have a good team, and it's really important. Our team are all um, permanent, temporary. The people that are scared of permanent jobs, they want to be river guides and skiers and doing this all year long, but they really know how to run water. And it's really important when you're running down the river that you know how to read water and know where to go and why. So uh, first thing I did is I got together with uh, RDI and we put together a system where we're using a uh, survey grade, not a survey grade, but a GPS antenna that's a compass. So it gives us our orientation and our position. We wired this up specifically how I wanted it and um, to a laptop top computer with a uh, data acquisition system. Because these are uh, made to do discharge and so using the discharge software you get with the, with the instrument is very cumbersome. So we set up and it's pretty much automatic and they have a couple little lights on a, on, a, on a screen that they can look at that tells them if they have bottom track, tells them if they have GPS, tells them they're recording data. No data, no pay. Um, so it just tells you things are functioning, right? And it automatically every 20 minutes starts a new file and records that all day long. So the person in the wrap just can focus on on one thing. It was a big jump to go from a raft with two people, somebody rowing and somebody operating the instrument, to one person. And in business, that's crucial. So these acoustic Dopplers put out, um, th this particular brand here has five beams. The middle one measures the depth. And the outside one um, are spread out in an area. And what they do is they will, <coughs> If there's anything being injected in the water column, and there's always material in the water column, that the sound beams that are hitting that, that effective particle will come back with a, with a Doppler shift, a shift in frequency. And that shift in frequency is linearly related to how fast the water is flowing. And so these instruments are sampling uh, you get basically two uh, uh, ensembles every second, so they're sampling every beam in time to get the 10 centimeter bin intervals all the way to the bottom along each one of the beams. That gets put together, keeping track of the boat speed, the butt rocking, the pitch and roll, and um, into a data ensemble that has uh, velocity components to it. And it also has, well, there's a whole bunch. You get back to your uh, intensity of your beam. We have a, 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 a blanking distance at the top right below the instrument and a blanking distance right at the bottom down here. And this is where you get interference from uh, signals coming in and signals going back out. And so we lose that portion. Right. So we're left with these 10 centimeter bin intervals. We get one from 30 centimeters basically down to 30 meters, and you get two of those bin intervals every second as it's going down all day long for all the rafts in the row. Uh, 
Um, we run eight of these, and then we have three more that run a Sontac, which is a, they call it M9. It has nine beams, has some advantages um, and some disadvantages. Some of the disadvantages are they don't let you into the raw data the way RDI does. And um, so we mainly stick with these. We're hooked up, spent a lot of time with a motorcycle shop in Vegas to get the, if you look down here, the control for the speed for these little Honda uh, engines is all, was a thing we had to create, you know. Honda didn't put that out. These are air-cooled. Um, we're in muddy rivers a lot, and when you have water-cooled engines, and then they can heat up, and then you're done. So this is the system we went with, designed our own uh, mast. It's hardwired and it does not come apart. I mean, it does, but all the time I spent in the field of electronic equipment, the bugaboo is taking stuff apart and putting it back in the box. And they make the boxes so they're small for air airlines, right? But every time you put it back together, there's a bent pin, there's a piece of dirt, or something, you spend all day long fixing that. Well, that's pretty hardcore, but no, no, hardwired all the way. We just collect it with the laptop to it. This is a river we just finished here a few months ago. It's the Ponderé River. It's about 30 miles along. And what you're looking at is a plot of, of just the water depth for every ensemble. And to give you some idea about how densely we try to pack this river uh, with data. And this particular run is below a dam. They were holding the flow steady for it. They held it for about a week while we were going up and down and measuring. Um, but you get a really good idea of, you know, how water depth is distributed. And this particular section of the river popped out big time in terms of its depth. And it was driving the, the, the clients as the tribe and the USGS. Out of, they're looking at temperature in this reservoir. Um, it's a run of the river reservoir. And there's a lot of anomalies in, in, the, in it. And one of them is this area here. They have no idea about no, no more bathymetry to work with, really. So right off the bat, you get some nice idea that the one area that they were having anomalous measurements in their temperature readings is, is kind of related to the, the symmetry of the river. When you start looking at the flow, you can see that as well. This is that river, one section of it. And uh, we can see our uh, crew going down the side. And what we're going to try to do now is with river analyzers, so I'm going to kind of transition how we deal with all this data, is Inter interpolate between these two points. So we're just going to go along with this uh, geographer's law of Tobler that you know you can interpolate between near points and have pretty good measurements relative to modeling that's trying to figure out what the flow resistance on that river is and solve for that depth and velocity at that point. Does that make sense to folks? Because it's kind of a big, we, what we do in River Analyzer is we interpolate between measurements as opposed to use hydraulic modeling to predict that. Okay, so the missing values can be filled in with existing data. The higher the data density, the better those values will be. So we go down in a river in a path like you see at the top. LiDAR data is often available and we will sync the LiDAR data to the channel imagery that we're, uh, or the channel measurements we're taking, we tri don't go really close side by side. When you start getting to a couple meters apart from one raft to the other raft, now you're getting signals from the other instruments. So there's a little bit of crosstalk going around. We want to just avoid that. And um, we get our, our, um, our depth velocity bins here. And within each bin, we have a velocity component so we can solve for the, the magnitude and direction along each one of those cells if we want. And at the very end, I'll show you how I, we use that kind of information to look at the dispersion of a, of a river. This is another uh, river we just, we just finished this one last week I gave this talk. Um, this is a Priest River. It's really a beautiful one, kind of rough at the very beginning. So if you notice, there's nobody has any instruments on. We took the first day and ran the, ran the real rough section. So everybody got a good handle on their line where they're going, and um, how to handle their rafts. Because these are little rafts. They're only eight foot on team, you know, for fishing. Right? they got $60,000 of electronics on them. So I, love, I want them to come back alive, <laughs> hopefully with the instruments as well. 
But what I'll show you here, I'm just going to jump ahead, is a, some cross sections from integrating this kind of data of where those pictures are both taken. And that's right here. So you, you get a nice cross section. When you're in really fast water, it tends to be quite angular, like you see here. I mean, the real river isn't that angular, but you're going so fast through it that you're not getting as many points as you could if you went really slow and they'd smooth it out. But this is really important for fisheries habitat because if you're a big fish, you're taking these blue areas up in here as prime habitat and even down in here and over here and let the food come to you. You're sitting down there, you're not putting out any energy. Food's coming to you. The smaller fish are in these areas here, darting up to these eddy lines where all the fishermen will be casting their flies, right? And they're picking those little fish off to, as well. <coughs> so this, uh, really the take home value here I'm trying to get is that aquatic habitat is three dimensional. And we're at best trying to describe things two dimensionally across the river system. And that's, that's one of the things I'm hoping to uh, break through. So let's talk a little bit about uh, river analyzer. LiDAR data, for the most part, there's new LiDARs out right now that will penetrate water. <coughs> I've seen them down to, for topographic stuff, down to three to four meters in coastal areas. But you need clean water. One of, the, one of our members of, of our team, he just finished his PhD and he developed his own LiDAR and they were measuring fish in reservoirs down to 30 meters. They're getting pings off the fish and then they're getting pings off the hydrothermal vents. This was in Yellowstone Lake and so they're mapping out with, with that. But it's a single beam, not a broad based beam. Anyway, then we put the bathymetry together, seen those two, and then add the flow field onto it. This is the idea. Here's a screenshot um, from River Analyzer. So underneath of the imagery that we have here is the LiDAR data. You can see that as a green line here, and then this is a blue line through that data integration window. That's the water surface, and that's the depth, and there's the flow. Okay. So the other thing we can do, and I'll, I'll kind of just jump a little bit ahead, is we can do multiple flows on the same reach and stack this data on top of each other. And how we do that is we're essentially measuring the relationship between depth and velocity for every square meter that's out there. And we get a regression service that we can plot. And that's how we add up and then we can uh, look at any kind of discharge that's coming up. I'll show you some of that as we get through. Okay, so here's a map of uh, the, the river, the Flathead River, where, where I live actually. And um, I did this for the county. Everybody was pretty much aware of this really deep hole here. It's about 90 feet deep there. But most of the one at the very top, there are a few fishermen that know about that, but most people have no, no idea. 90 foot de uh, deep hole in the Sand Bend River. You know, pretty interesting. The Doug and I are figuring out how come it doesn't fill with sand? Because there's a lot of sand moving down there. I'll save that for another talk. So here's the mean flow velocity. And this is at a low flow. And it's actually, this lake here is backing up water all the way through this fish. So it's really slow. <laughs> Basically have surface water on the top. And you also have a flow on the very bottom that's going out of here. Now I want to uh, describe a, a concept. It's called a brood number. And the fruit number, uh, for those of you who don't know, is an is a indice that looks at the energetic state of that water column. Okay, and it comes from this. Look at some red spot and ask yourself, well, I wonder how deep it is. We go back and, oh, okay, we see it's that deep. We go back to velocity. Fruit number allows you to put those two quantities together. That's a, a really kind of easy way to, to think about it. And fruit number also has some really interesting relationships with different types of habitat. As you go from these ripple runs or rapid runs, <coughs> ripple pools, these various sequences that seem to be organized along a reach until you get into, I mean, we just looked at the, at the Flathead River, it's all just a big sand run, right? These various habitats you can start to identify and relate to each other by combining depth, velocity, and looking at isoflows of fruit number. 
Okay? That's what this shows. This is from the whole river on the Olympic Peninsula. It's 12 kilometers of a river. And what you're looking at is the total number of pixels or area of the river within each of those depth velocity bin intervals and how it fits into a gradation of, of fruit. So all of everything within this band here would be kind of the same kind of energetic water unit, if you will, but much different in terms of its depth and its velocity relationships. I don't have time to go into it, but if you really know about specific energy and how specific energy works, it's a tool, the reason I'm into this is it's a tool to look at how rivers self-organize. Um, but I'll come back for that talk later. <laughs> I kind of touch on it this afternoon in my next talk. This one is looking at the same thing, and it's of the NIAC where I showed you that first, that first picture, and it's another 12 meter run. But we're looking at really low flow all the way up to a flood condition. Okay, and you can see, if you're a juvenile fish, you have lots of habitat in this upper <coughs> low flow that you can go to. You can find some flow refugia. But when it's flooding like this, your river needs to be connected to the floodplain to find off-channel habitat to get out of that. So fish move around the river to find flow refugia, to find food, to keep them getting eaten, <laughs> uh, for a whole host of things. Uh, they, they use it all. Now what we're going to do is, um, what I've done is say, you can take that graph of fruit number and basically put it into habitats and think of this as a changing spatial distribution of those habitats over some, uh, some range of discharge and then at each one of those stops or wherever one you could pull out the total abundance so it's a how much habitat we have based on these criteria of depth and velocity and where how is it spatially distributed this particular <coughs> exercise was funded by the Wild Fish Conservancy because they're interested in this habitat back here for coho salmon rearing. And what they wanted to do was allow that there's riprap all along in here. And they wanted to breach that riprap and allow the river to connect into here and provide some more juvenile <coughs> habitat that's out there. Oh, excuse me. So that's the river mapping and stacking. The cool thing about this is we can do, with river mapping, about 50 kilometers a day. So we can just pulverize the river over broad spatial scales quickly. And you can't do that with modeling. So if you can take that kind of measurements, couple it with the model, and you've now taken these models and initiated them, validated them, and make them very valuable tools as opposed to trying to use models to describe the river. I'm not an anti-model person, I don't model, I'm very curious, but that's kind of my message there. And so, the next thing we haven't even talked about is how do you actually, once you have all this habitat data, how do you make a, a assessment of what does it mean for a fish, right? And so here's uh, some data from a colleague of mine working on the Colorado, the San Pedro River in Colorado, and it's about suckers. Most people aren't interested in suckers. Um, but they are in the native species in this reach. And then here's the depth velocity for one of those graphs I showed you, but bin similarly. And the idea is to put those together to give you <coughs> maps like this that show you the spatial distribution in terms of habitat for this particular fish. And here would be the, the histogram is showing you, you know, how many fish could be in that, in that reach. So this is really important for hydropower and trying to find environmental flow needs for the organisms that are out there, all driven by ESA laws. And that's what kind of drives our business. This is the one that iconic, this is a steelhead in British Columbia, and what everybody is really after out in the Pacific Northwest. That fish has gone to sea seven times, come back and spawn. It's a big, huge female. And um, so everybody's into that, and it's 
it's relatively easy to get funding to study this fish, <laughs> but this is a really cool fish. This is a pallid sturgeon. It's a female. She's 65 years old. They've had a, uh, a tag in her for 18 years. They chase her all over the river, take her eggs. They've got a bunch of males they do out there, and they you then take it to hatchery to, to raise because pallet sturgeon are basically endangered throughout the whole Missouri Mississippi system, right? And Montana has the last remaining pure genetic strain of these fish, and so we, we supply the rest. Um, but they're not reproducing very well in the sections that they're at. And they really don't know why, and they're trying to find out what the reasons are, so they can look at how to operate the dam to maximize some success for these fish and crew. There's only 120 or 150 of them they have to make left. They live to be over 100 years old. So they're kind of the same lifespan as a human. They don't start reproducing until they're 18. So, uh, and the problem they've been having is they've been taking the little fish about this big and put them in the river and some of those will succeed to the adult, but they're not finding any natives that are, or any, even any hatchery ones, that are successfully reproducing. So they think there's something in their reproduction, how they use the river to reproduce that's impacting, it's a bottleneck for their uh, moving forward as a population and sustainable. They have a very interesting uh, reproduction. They don't make a, a red in the sediments like salmon do. The female will find a really deep spot and fast spot in the river. Males will come over the top to release her eggs. They release the sperm that uh, incubates the egg or fertilizes the egg. And then as it incubates, it takes about 10 days that they drift down these embryo of these little eggs and the fish, use up their, their sac and uh, just drifts as free, free drifting embryos until they find some shallow water habitat where they need to start eating and growing. So the question is, they don't think it's in this fertilization component. They think the problem is in the drifting larvae, but they're all getting flushed from Fort Peck Reservoir down to Sacagawea Reservoir. That's a 400 kilometer reach. They end up in that, get flushed into that reservoir, sink to the bottom, it's anoxic, and they die. And because of that, they can't do anything to change the operation of the dam. The other thing might be, well, if some of them are going into these shallow water habitats, maybe we don't need to be running the river up and down and up and down like mad and disconnecting the juvenile rearing habitats where these embryos may actually be ending up. That is a multi-million dollar change in operation because we're storing water in Montana for the shipping industry in the lower Mississippi. And that's how this river system is used. And it's a very important one. So here's the study section. Um, from the 1D modeling done by the Army Corps of Engineers, they said that drift duration is six days. And uh, they're all dead. So what we went out there is that, well, there's this idea of a flushing hypothesis, and then we came up with this dispersion hypothesis that says if we knew where all the flow paths were, we could look at how dispersive that river is and see what it takes or what percentage or how long it takes to get flushed down the river just based on connecting the, the flow block, block valve. The flushing hypothesis, they dumped 700,000 of these embryos over, they've done this three different times. And the idea is that they move down as an intact plume, like this, all the way to the end. Okay? Um, my argument is they're just immediately dispersed everywhere. So what we did, we took the team down the river, a lot of really good people there. <laughs> and um, we're focusing right now after trying to connect all of the flow vectors in every little bin. And we use a, a creaking routine then to say between the ones that where we measured and we know where they're going, let's connect, you know, if this one's pointing this way and that one's pointing that way, the other ones get a, a, an arrow associated with them. So we can look at the bottom, we're essentially looking at the bottom 50 centimeters of the river, the bottom boundary layer, and we're going to look at the mean water column, its flow factors. So 
here's a, that's uh, a same reach that we looked at. Um, oh, actually, I'm going to show you the, this is the first time I looked at a reach. Everything in blue is, uh, is, is from the ADP data. Everything in the light blues to yellows is uh, LIDAR data. And so you can see the complexity of this. Those stars that represent areas where they would dump the embryos and be set up downstream and try to catch them in the nets. Okay? And they would set these up periodically down the river and do this for 10 days all the way down to the bottom. I can tell you they, out of this, let me just ask you, out of 700,000, how many do they think they got they caught in the nets? I'm not saying they're not, they're bad netters, but it's a very, you know, <laughs> difficult thing to do. Just a guess, just a watch. Let me throw a wild guess out. How many? 70,000. Huh? 70,000? 10%. Huh? 10%. 10%? Two. Two embryos in the first mile. Zero the rest of the river. And they did three of these. So they're less than 1% recovery. And concluding that they're all flushing to the bottom. It's not right. So here's that same reach. And what we've done is we've mapped it. And we said, OK, 1 through 5 and 6 through 10 are release points. Where would those embryos go following that path? And so we can see the path. We can see the, the, the velocity along the path. Some of them are making it to the very end, and some do not. You can see the rates. And so just on this two kilometer, this is their reference reach. So they do all their 3D modeling here, too, and then try to say what goes on on the river, which is at odds with the empirical data. Um, but based on this, it would be 16 days to cover the 225 miles. Um, so that was the first look. Now if we start looking at it in cross sections through there, and we're going down the river like this, and we go over and down like that, by the time you get to the lower part of the river down here, it's 300 meters across, your little em embryo that's delivered over to here, right there this big, they can dart about that far. They have to get into this mean flow to get flushed to the, to the, to the downstream. So all of them, if that plume gets spread out like it does, have to figure out, you have to know where that thal wag is, and how do you know that, you know? It's hard enough just going down the river in a raft to figure out where the thal wag is, let alone to know that I'm a fish and I need to dart, 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 dart that way. Not to mention the predation is unbelievable. When you start darting like that around in there, you're drawing attention to bigger fish. Because you can't see them. You can't see your hand as far in front of you. So if we go down the river and we do 400 kilometers of it and divided it into basically five kilometer segments and we would do these, this Kriggy routine over just that and start it again on the next one. And really the only reason is because we're doing this on a laptop and it takes about five hours for each of them. You have to add up all of those. That and I didn't want to propagate errors from one segment to the next segment. So we're just kind of looking at how things disperse in four meter segments. This is the mean water column. That's a vector for the flow. You can see distributed out of here. We, we, we always do this release across here at one location. The reason for that is, is when I first came up with this, we had a rupture in an oil uh, pipeline on the Yellowstone, and it flushed crude down it. And I had just finished this and excitedly went to Exxon and DWR. We can see where the crude is going and how to clean it up, the bottom up. They didn't want to know where it went. Because <laughs> what they do is they go down the river and wipe the bushes off on the top, make it look good on the surface, but the bottom is just full of heavy crew and going into all the other holes and raising hell with the other organisms that live down there. Not to mention the pile of sturgeon larvae. But these stall points are just where things stall out on the river. One of them actually makes it to go on. So that's just a complete flow path to that section. And this is the bottom boundary there. So what we can do is compare the flow paths on the top with the flow paths on the, in, the, in the mid column to see how well they match. If, they're, if there's perfect flushing, they're going to be all together and everything's going to flush downstream. If not, they're dispersed all over the place. And we can track their velocity along those paths to get some idea of how long it takes to get down the river. So that's the graph Army Corps does not like. That's a, it's a very dispersing river system. 
we're looking at you know three kilometers plus or minus dispersion. Everything should be right. I mean, a lot of it is, but everything should be right in there to get all of those embryos down in six days. So, conclusions on this part of the palisturgeon application is that complex channel bathymetry and flow patterns control the larval dis, uh, drift speed and dispersion. I mean, that to me, you'd know that going into the field to begin with. You don't need to measure it other than this field. This river is so muddy, you can't see it really. Drift dispersion is supported by the empirical data. Some of them can. You know, from our analysis, we found 10% of them would probably make it. And 90% are swept into the thaw way. Drifters on the bottom. And that's the other thing, too, is our theory was that they're all drifting along the bottom. Well, they got a 31-day drift. They got plenty of river to work with. So the question is, where are they being dispersed? And all those little yellow dots along there allows us to go back now and look at the quality and the quantity of that kind of habitat and how is it connected and disconnected as they operate the dam up and down. That's a big, that's the next step. So that one diagram I showed you, is a juvenile rearing habitat? Is it? it probably is. And that's probably where they need to start looking at and not flushing the dam so wildly. In general, you know, ecology fundamentally is based on looking at the distribution and abundance of aquatic, and in a case of aquatic ecology, aquatic biota, in the context of how and why these organisms use biophysical space, as well as functional processing, how these spaces are linked. In, in for rivers, groundwater, surface water exchange, flooding, channel and bar formation are all processes that are interwoven into the distribution of biota. And it's important because it might be one stage of their life cycle that's, their, that's impacting them. Aquatic habitat is the least quantified attribute of rivers and streams. Zero data on it. Quantifying how that habitat exists in a river, where it's located relative to other important habitats, is it near a spring brook? Is it near uh, overhanging uh, vegetation? Providing shade. How does that change as a function of flow regulation? Especially in the light of climate change. Because rivers are changing big time. We're drying up and others are in tiny of flows. A lot of change going on there. And we can't counter it all with our knobs on the dams. Some of it we can't do anything about. We're just going to have to walk away from some and go to other areas and try to preserve the better. Anyway, all of this is very key for assessing, uh, assessing environmental flow. And I think this high-resolution hydroacoustic river mapping is, a, is an important tool. I think it's going to really help us address these types of issues just have, as I have um, shown here. So, any questions? Before you ask a question, check out the date. This is the solstice, that is the moon. And that campground was also occupied by Lewis and Clark when they went up. And there I mean, hasn't been any changes in the river itself. So 10 o'clock at night in Montana, we're still awake. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the third beer, but <laughs> anyway. surface temperature. The sensor itself needs, um, its response time is a minute. And so you're flowing through various temperatures of water so you get a real a smeared view, but important view of the river. And in this section, the shallow water habitat, they needed to have about 18 degrees C before 
those fish are really going to um, take off and go. And the dam is releasing from the bottom, so it's coming out at 6 degrees C. So it takes quite a while for it to heat up and for you to get the right temperatures down there. There's, there's more to it than just controlling the flow. We also got to take water off the surface. It's a real biggie. Um, temperature is, is cool because when you map out that temperature pattern, it's really another measurement of turbulence in the mixing. So it's, but it's like mostly like the surface. So if you were in a system that wasn't very turbulent, mm -hmm. it might, you know, where you almost have some sort of, you know, boundary layer. Right. I kind of get a full picture of like perhaps what's going on. Right. Might be experiencing. Right. And that's exactly that first slide I showed you. I said, look at this one section of the river, it's really deep there. The temperature measurements there, the, the bottom and the surface were the same. It was really befuddling because they thought, of, and it's like ooh, 10, 15 meters deep there. And it's actually thermally stratified during the summer a lot. But that section, which they expected to be thermally stratified, was thoroughly mixed based on temperature. The section above it is, you, when you start looking at the flow velocity, it's mixing from the top to the bottom. So you're delivering all this well-mixed water down to the section that they thought was thermally stratified. Yeah, great question. Yes? Um, you mentioned that the bathymetric LIDAR required clear water. Yeah. So how clear is clear? Uh, <laughs> so if you look at an aerial photograph and you can see the bottom, that's barely clear enough. Yeah, it's really it's getting better, but I mean the, the, the it's not it's limited by the, that's really high in, in impulse energy, and so when you have a lidar that penetrates water, it's very dangerous for your eyes, and so that's kind of really what's holding it back, trying to get into the right frequency range and the right intensities that won't hurt you know people, animals, cows, you know. But it's, it's coming along. Some of the best LIDAR I use, it actually came out of the University of Alabama. A startup company runs their LIDAR off of a drone and we use it on uh, a lot. It's, it's incredible, that's like a $50,000 piece of equipment. Whereas five years ago, to put that in a plane was almost two million. Green LIDARs through the roof, I don't even look at it anymore, it's beyond my capability. Oh, I was wondering, are you able to map, um, say, uh, losing losing versus gaining sections along the river? Oh, these that, guys are good. Is that like an influence between yes. breeding habitats or other? Yes, particular? we get we get a cross section every ten meters. You can go less, but we go for every ten, and you can. So there's a lot of variability along that as you go down because discharge. You want to find a nice U-shaped channel. Everything's together, right? And the whole Alder River is always there. And you don't have that when you measure everywhere. <laughs> so there's variance about it. But the trends definitely show you the gainings and losing reaches. And on this particular river, one section, I mean, it just, I looked at the temperature and, oh my God, it went from 16 to six degrees C at 100 meters. Like, what is going on? Then I started looking, there was a huge scour hole there. And then you looked at the, at the velocity, there's just, we gained 10% of the flow, you know, like 100 meters. So it was just bubbling up from, from below. Yeah, that's what a lot of people are after. The two things that you guys are just getting after. Groundwater surface water exchange, temperatures. I'm trying to bring them back because you don't even know how deep or how fast it's going. Let's <laughs> just get that done first. <laughs> but it comes with it. And then the variability. That that the variability is a function of how complex that habitat is. So it's a really it's a people freak out, oh god, the variability of your discharge all over the place. I says, Yeah, but look at that signal. It's a huge, robust signal of habitat complexity. Uh, so, in the, as you mentioned, you started with uh, some categories of observations, so uh, Ullerian, Lagrangian, and as you carefully mentioned, you said uh, for the river dynamics modeling is used to Ullerian, like as boundary conditions. So, so how did Lagrangian observations could inform those numerical models? Well, sense? first of all, it's going to get a, a really good measurement of the bathymetry between each one. So you're not having to make any kind of assumptions about what it is different from what you're doing in transect. The second thing is, if you're running a model and you're, predict, you're trying to make everything fit between this transect and this transect, right? So that you can predict between those transects, then it's validation data in terms of, like, we have a measurement right here between there that's this deep and this fast. What does your velocity measurement say? So it's gonna, re and, it, and our distribution of the velocities out there is totally reflecting the actual flow resistance between those. 
And so you get a really good measurement of validities of discharges, and then how do you get to go to the model to fix that? You're going to have to desegregate your flow resistance elements that are in there. So it's a nice feedback mechanism. And once you've got it built and you've stacked it up, now you can start using models with all those what if scenarios. You know, what if we put an engineered log jam in here? How will that impact the habitat and the flow velocity fields that are out there? That's what I'm hoping it comes from. It's how people realize that and don't get freaked out about I'm trying to replace model and say, wow, this is an incredible tool we can use to really make our models good. Representation um, mark. My question is about. Uh, I mean, how are we uh, going to use this tool? I mean, are you? Do you have a software, or are you providing uh, lidar services, or are you providing these integrated systems, or are you just providing a service where? investigator hires you guys to do this profile? Yes, we, we, uh, so freshwater map business, it, it's basically we're collecting data. And a lot of clients, they don't care about the flow field, they just want the bathymetry. And then they hear about the flow field, oh, well, we want the flow as well. So sometimes they want bathymetry and mean flow data and they'll use it in ArcGIS or in their modeling. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to collect this kind of data. And we have a team that we put on the field, out in the field we're about $15,000 a day, so it's actually really cheap to gather data, you know, minus our, uh, we have to add our mobilization, demobilization costs. So if you just want data, I'm happy to go out there and set the team in the, on the river and move down and, and use it. Uh, the river analyzer software, you don't need it, you know. Um, it basically is a nice way of integrating the slices and doing the creaking. So sometimes we'll use ArcGIS and do the topo to raster interpolations, make a map, right? And then we'll make a map with the linear approaches and the river analyzer and the Kriegian approaches. And you're taking the same data set and you're able to look at it really robustly in three different ways. And you'll see differences. And the Kriegian really smooths things out. I was quite surprised at that. So you said during the talk that uh, uh, maybe you guys do like 200 kilometers in a day? 50 is a lot of maps, yeah. So still, it uh, boils down to $15,000 for 50 kilometers of profile? That would be as cheap as I'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is, is you get on these rivers, you know, and now there's not a takeout every 50 Right, I mean, uh, 50 kilometers. Uh, but idea yeah, that so that for we did 400 kilometers for 150,000. But, but that was collecting the data and analyzing the data. So if you don't want any an an analysis, you just want the data, Especially if you don't want us to um, to use the export templates, that's the one part of River Analyzer is not automatic yet. So some person has to sit there and file one and export it, and then it say, "I'll make sure everything is in the right units." And they screw up a lot. So I'll get plots of data and look at this is not right. Who do you mean it's not right? And I say, "These values are oh look at they're all three about three times higher than they should be." Wrong units, go back and redo it again. And the software right now is patent pending uh, in the US and Canada. Um, it's worthless without data, right? And the data is not valuable unless you have another means of utilizing it. Yeah, I was just wondering how university PIs can collaborate and how would the cost? Oh, okay, yeah, I would love to have, I mean, that's why I'm on kind of this circuit going around talking to people to see, because I think, you know, you have an NSF grant, and that's 50 grand for an, uh, equipment, you know, that's a limit, right? And and one of the, each one of those units is over 60 itself, you know, and that's not any of the time to put it together and fabricate stuff, so it's really expensive equipment. I have yes. a question, I'm working coastal areas, have you considered using these methods in, um, Tidally influenced areas? Oh, we have, yeah. We were working down in the California in the, in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Okay. And specifically to look at a 25 mile an hour, 25 mile reach that we would do repeatedly mm -hmm. and look at the flood tide as it moves up and how it was changing the, the drifting patterns. Yes. Yeah. So they're important habitats, estuaries, and mm -hmm. very diverse. And it could have really great uh, application, except that you have to consider the tide. 
which probably makes your calculations more complicated. You know, in terms of velocity. All, all it knows is how deep it is and how fast it's going. And so you're, you're integrating it and with time, we know where we are then. You see the tide, you see it going up and down, mm -hmm. you know, and you see it in the, in the reversal of the flows and the, the data that you right. put together. So you can, you can plot the tide as it moves up and okay. look at tide in, at, in time and say, okay, we're at this part of the river at slack tide and we actually planned our, our um, data collection to coincide with a, a uh, divergence in, from the main river to, a, to another slough mm -hmm. to see how the water was fluxing mm -hmm. down that because mm -hmm. delta smelt were using the tidal, or they theoretically thinking they're using the, the tidal flow up, just surfing, if you will, up river. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to get them flushed into Georgia and Slough. That goes down into the other areas where it's full straight bass and eat them all. So, yeah, to bring some geomorphologists in there to solve it. I have a question. Yes. Uh, now you said that uh, you used the Doppler shift to calculate the velocity of the flow. Yes. Based on particle size. So no, it's not based on particle size. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just based. On, it's actually it's the intensity of the. Um, uh, you need to have enough particles in the water column to get an, an intense enough, enough signal back. Right. So my question is, is, is sediment concentration one of your derivative products? God, you guys are really good. Bingo. It's hard to get at the green side. But yeah, so we could, if I, I could plot those velocity flow fields in terms of the intensity of the beam coming back. And you would have the, a surrogate for the suspended uh, solid concentration. But what you need to do is couple it with another acoustic instrument that has all of the beams of different frequencies going along the same path, and that gets you then to the grain size distribution. So it, that part hasn't been calibrated yet. Um, the simplest thing to do that I have done is gone up there and just actually get water samples and say, what's the concentration here? What is the intensity here? You can get rough, really you know, um, rough estimates of that. But one of the more important things you get is where is it? How is it concentrated across that flow? And if you go sample over here and it's very not very concentrated and really highly concentrated over here and really high flow, that's your main flux of sediment that's moving down. And you might be missing that or something. Really a stupid question. I love this. This is fun. I sit in my office at home most of the time, you know, <laughs> by myself. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Push the button, and I'll tell you what you're going to do. For free. <laughs> Let's uh,